Romans chapter 13. And we're looking at our relationship to the government. I want to begin with by reading to you a letter to a man named Diognetus from 130 AD. It's about Christians. Listen to this. Christians are indistinguishable from other men either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. And yet there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. They play their full role as citizens but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon the earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians were different because they were citizens of two kingdoms. They were citizens of heaven and they're citizens of their earthly government and their their earthly country. It's interesting that uh, my wife and I are going through the naturalization process here. We're about to become dual citizens in the next few months. So we're citizens of the United States of America, but now we're going to become citizens of the United Kingdom. And when I was growing up in school, every day, I don't know if they do this anymore, probably not, but every day we would stand to our feet and we'd put our hands over our heart and we'd say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then we'd sit down. Every day we would say that. And so we're pledging allegiance to the country in which we were born. But now we become dual citizens. And it's interesting when you think about this, that if you're a Christian, you are a dual citizen. You're a citizen of heaven, but you're also a citizen of the UK or whatever other country you're a citizen of. And the thing about us as Christians is, our allegiance to the kingdom of God trumps our allegiance to any other political system or any other country that we may be citizens of. And because of that, Christians should be the best citizens there are. Should be the best citizens in any country. I want to read the first seven verses of Romans chapter 13, and then we're going to take it apart verse by verse. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, just to bring you into the context of where this takes place in the book of Romans, we're in a section now which is response. So, in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, God showed us that we were sinners deserving of judgment, but because of His great love and mercy for us, Christ died in our place to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven and come into a relationship with God. And then in chapter 12, it shifts in saying, since you know God's mercy, now this is what you're to do. Okay, and that's a very important way of looking at the Christian life. Because the Christian life is not do, 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 and then hopefully you'll get to heaven. The Christian life is the moment you put your faith in Jesus, you're saved 
You're going to heaven, and then God then has you walking with Him and serving Him. It's a massive difference. Otherwise, if you don't get it right, you get the cart before the horse. And you try to work all these things to please God, and you'll never make it. So God says, here's what I'll do. I'll give it to you by a free gift of grace. Now serve me. So, this is our response to what God has done. And because of this, this changes many relationships that we have. First and foremost, our relationship with God. So it says in Romans 12.1, I beseech you, I urge you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So when we look at what God's done for us, we say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to, to follow after you. The second relationship is between us and our brothers and sisters in Christ. So he talks about the gifts that have been given to us by God in order to give to the, the church. So that affects that relationship as well. And then he goes on to explain about our relationship to society at large, believers and unbelievers. And he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be sincere. Really love people. Christians, non-Christians alike. And now he gets to our relationship to the government. And so we're going to ask some questions today. What should be our attitude toward the government? Is it ever right to disobey the government? And if so, when? What's the purpose of government? Why do we pay taxes? And these kind of questions we will answer. Let's look at the first one. What should be our attitude toward the government? Well, look at verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Here's the short answer. What should be our attitude toward government? We're to submit to the government. We're to be subject to them. And it says, let every soul, all of us, every one of us should be submitted to the government. He says, the next thing he says though is, for there is no authority except from God. Now, this is a very sweeping general statement about all of creation. There is no authority except that which God has established. Now, it's interesting that he wrote this at the time that Nero was on the throne. And if any of you know about Roman history, Nero was a really nasty fellow. And he persecuted, eventually persecuted Christians to the death. But he says, you need to be in subjection to the government. Now, God has established authorities in His creation. Look at natural law, for instance. You've got the law of gravity. Now, if you ever try to disobey the law of gravity, it has painful consequences. I mean, you can jump off a 10-story building and flap your wings all you want going down and say, I'm going to defy this law. But in a matter of seconds, you'll find out that you cannot defy it. Natural law. Entropy is another natural law. Disorder increases with time. And we might think, well, I can take these potions on my face and go out to the gym and I can keep myself young and healthy looking for a long time. But eventually entropy will take over and you will start to look older. That's just the way of natural law. There's also order in families. And so we have husbands and wives being in submission to one another. We have children being in submission to parents. And then there's submission and order and authority within the government. Now I was speaking with someone the other day at work. And she said to me, I don't think anyone should have to submit to authority. Have you ever heard that before? We see sometimes these statements, you know, question authority or go for anarchy or something like that. I don't think anyone should have to submit to authority. And I said to her, because she has four kids, I said, well, what if you told one of your girls to go up to their room and tidy it up? And she said, no, I don't want to do that. And she said, oh, you're right. I think somebody should, should have to submit to authority. We have to submit to these authorities, don't we? Submit is a bad word today 
We don't like to hear the word submit. And the reason is we think of submission as being inferior. We automatically equate submission to being inferior, but that's not so. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 11.3 that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, often when I speak to, to women about submitting to their husbands, and by the way, the Bible says that men are to submit to their wives also. We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. That is submission. But the man is the head of the wife. In other words, the final word comes down to the husband. And often when I talk to women about this, they say, that's, that's awful, that's oppressive, and that makes me feel inferior. But you see, in this one verse it says, but the head of Christ is God. Jesus Christ submitted himself to God, to the will of the Father. And yet Jesus Christ was equal with the Father. Submission has nothing to do with superiority or inferiority. But it has to do with a heart that recognizes the authorities that God has set up. So, Jesus Christ, His head was God. So that proves that um, submission is not a bad word. Nebuchadnezzar, great king of Babylon, tried to deny this principle of God's authority. One time he was up on the top of his palace. He's looking out over all of what he thought he had made. And he said, This is great Babylon that I have made for myself by my own power. My own hands have done it. And just then, God's voice came down to him and and he basically took the whole kingdom away from Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. And this is what it says in Daniel chapter 4. Look what I have made, he said. And God took it away. And then it says this. This decision is by the decree of the watchers. And the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order that the living may know. Notice. That the most high rules in the kingdom of men. Gives it to whomever he will. And sets over it the lowest of men. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn a very hard lesson. That God's in control ultimately. And he sets up authorities. He raises Men up to positions of power and he can take them down again. Jesus himself was submitted to authority. He was submitted to the government. When Jesus was on trial before Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate said to Jesus, because Jesus refused to answer him, he said, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power, I I have authority to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. In that one statement, Jesus confirmed three things. He confirmed that Pilate did indeed have some authority. He also confirmed that God gave him that authority. And that Jesus was submitted to the authority of Pontius Pilate. Jesus was submitted to government authorities when he was here on this earth. There was another time when the Pharisees came to Jesus and they wanted to trap him in his words so they could have something by which to put him to death. And so they, they got together, the Herodians, and they came to Jesus and they said, We know that you're a teacher who's come from God and you do all these marvelous things and you don't respect people. In other words, you're not courting the favor of people. You speak the way of God in truth. Tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now this would have put Jesus seemingly on the horns of a dilemma. Because if he said, no, it's not right to pay taxes to Caesar, they'd go to, uh, to Pontius Pilate and they'd say, this guy refuses to pay taxes to the Roman government. But if he said, yes, it is right to pay taxes to Caesar, this would make all the Jews upset because they hated the Romans. And Jesus' response was classic. He says, show me, the temple t- uh, show me the tax money. And they brought him a denarius, a little Roman coin. He says, whose image and inscription is on there? And they said, Caesar's. He says, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And after that, they didn't ask him any more questions. He busted them. Because in that one statement, he said, look, that money, is, it belongs to the Roman government. 
So you need to pay your taxes, but give the things that belong to God to God. Now, whose image and inscription is on us? It's God's image. We're made in His image. God wants us to give our lives to Him. And so they, they were dumbfounded by His comment. Jesus said it's right to pay taxes to Caesar. So Jesus was submitted to the government. And in fact, for us as followers of Jesus Christ, submission to the government is one evidence to the rest of the world that we follow Jesus. The Apostle Peter wrote about this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when He judges the world. For the Lord's sake, respect all authority, whether the king is head of the state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone. And love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. Peter says, if you really want to make an impact on those around you, one of the ways to do that is to be submitted to the government. To live in an honorable way. Now, is it ever right to disobey the government? If so, when? The Bible says that it's only right to disobey the government when the government commands us to disobey God. When the government commands us to disobey God. In Acts chapter 5, when the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, brought the disciples before them who were preaching the name of Jesus, they said, we command you not to speak about this man anymore in Jerusalem. You can't do it. You can't preach his name. You can't talk about him anymore. Well, the next thing you know, they're, they're in the temple and they're preaching about Jesus Christ. They bring him back before the Sanhedrin and said, Didn't we tell you you can't do that? And their answer was, We ought to obey God rather than men. And that's the answer that we would have to the government whenever they command us to do something that's contrary to the will of God. We've got to obey God rather than men. God's will trumps the will of the state, in other words. We see this way back in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 1. The Pharaoh told the Hebrew midwives, because the, the Jews were growing so much within the borders of Egypt, said, they're going to become too strong. They might cause an insurrection and, and uh, cause a problem for us. So, you Hebrew midwives, when there's a male child born, kill it. Well, they feared God more than they feared the command of the king. And so, they just allowed these Hebrew boys to live. And so, he calls them back. He says, didn't I tell you to kill them? And they lied about it to protect the children. They said, well, these Hebrew midwives, or these Hebrew wives, they give their birth so quickly that by the time we get there, they've already given birth and they're back in the fields working. They lied about it and yet God honored them for that. That was civil disobedience, and yet God honored them by giving them families. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel was told, you can't go and pray to any other god except for King Darius. And when he heard that ruling, he went right up to his upper room, opened the windows toward Jerusalem like he'd always done all these years, and he began to pray three times to the Lord. He obeyed God rather than men. Corey ten Boom, World War II, daughter of the watchmaker from Holland. She was hiding Jews in her house. And the Nazis would come along and knock on the door. Do you have any Jews here? No. I don't have any Jews here. I haven't seen a Jew in a long time. No. She lied to protect innocent life and God honored her for that. And so there is a time when we must disobey the government. 
but only when they command us to do things contrary to the will of God. Now look in verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Now, on January 2nd, 1974, in the U.S., they passed a a law lowering the national speed limit to 55 miles an hour. And my dad hated this. He couldn't stand it. When we would go on holiday, we would go from Cincinnati, Ohio, up to the northern part of Michigan, 500-mile journey. And my dad wanted to make that journey in eight hours flat. And he just couldn't do it at 55 miles an hour. And so he had to figure a way to beat the cops. So he got a fuzz buster. A fuzz buster is a radar detector. And he got a CB radio, right? And his, his handle in those days, you know, you talk to the truckers, his handle was moving violation. So he would call these guys and they would be down the road maybe 20 miles. Have you seen any... Smokies, he'd say. And they'd come back. Now I haven't seen any Smokies in about 20 miles. And he would just punch it and he would go as fast as he possibly could. So it was this big game between my dad and the cops. And often we would make it in eight hours flat. One toilet break. But one time we were going through the state of Ohio and they weren't using radar. They were using airplanes. And so we come around the corner and there's a big traffic jam and the cop just points right at my dad in the car and he says, like this, and he's like, oh man. So we go, we pull over. 55 miles an hour, that was not a good law. But we were to obey that law. Now, when you're driving the speed limit, you don't have to worry, do you? When you see a policeman and you're driving the speed limit, you don't worry at all. But when you're breaking the speed limit and you see a policeman around, what's your immediate thought? You look down at your speedo, don't you? Or you hit the brake immediately. Or you come up on a speed camera and you go, and then you drive slowly and then you punch it after that. When we obey the law, we don't have to be afraid of the authority, is what he's saying here. Verse 4, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now this answers the question of what is the purpose of government. It says here twice that he is God's minister to you. He's a minister. You ever think of David Cameron as a minister? I mean, we call them ministers, but do you ever really think of him as a minister of God? What about a policeman? A minister of God? And he's a minister to you to do two things. To restrain evil and to reward good behavior. This is an example of what we refer to as common grace. Common grace is grace or a gift of God that he gives to everybody, whether they're Christians or non-Christians. This is just grace for all people. As uh, Jesus said about common grace, he sends rain on the just and on the unjust, and he causes the sun to rise on the evil and and on the good. It's just something common for all people. It's a blessing. And common grace is necessary because of universal sin. Human governments are necessary because of universal sin. Every single one of us has a sin problem. We're born with it. We're all S-I-N positive, you could say. And we actually live this out. I mean, when you're... We we just dedicated little Oriana today. And you look at a little child and you think, Oh, they're just little angels, you know. They couldn't possibly do anything wrong. But you really don't have to teach a child how to sin. They do it automatically. You have to teach a child how not to sin. So we have a sin nature. And because of that, um, we need common grace. We need the government. And God establishes governments for us. Otherwise, 
there would be complete anarchy. Everybody doing what is right in their own eyes. And that would be a terrible place to live in. When we lived up north a number of years ago, uh, we lived near a military base. And so in the church where we were serving, we ministered to a lot of soldiers. And I had the opportunity to, to go to a, a discharging service for one of these soldiers. He'd finished his, his tour and he was being discharged from the army. And so after the service, I was able to talk to him. And I said, well, how's it feel to have been a minister of God all these years? And he says, excuse me? A minister of God? I said, yes, yeah, what it says right here in, in Romans 13, 4. You are God's minister. You serve God in your capacity. Just as much as I'm serving God in my capacity as a minister of the gospel, God's given you a task too. But notice what it says here. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. The sword is an instrument of lethal force. So this means that the government has the power of lethal force. And you think about that with the police. Um, There's debate now about whether um, more policemen should be armed. Because now they just have a few who are armed. Um, The military carries lethal force with it. It was right and proper that this nation and other nations stop the Nazis in World War II from doing what they were doing. If you do evil, be afraid, for they don't bear the sword in vain. But this also speaks of the right of a government to capital punishment. Now, in the UK, there hasn't been capital punishment since 1964. There was a moratorium for five years, and then in 1969, they enshrined it into law. But the courts still do give life sentences to those who commit murder. And this right of capital punishment goes way back to the Old Testament. To Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. This is after the flood. When God reissued some of his commands before the flood. And in this he says... Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So in that statement, he says, if a person kills someone, then they forfeit their own lives. God places such high value on human life that he says the the penalty for murder is the forfeit of your own life. It's death. Now, I've shared with you before that when I was living in the States, I used to do prison ministry at the maximum security prison in Santa Fe, which was about an hour away from where we lived. And we went into the, uh, the little pods there where they had all the murderers and very hard criminals. And there was one guy there that was the next in line to be executed in the state of New Mexico. And at the time... They hadn't executed anyone since 1960, and this was about 1996. And so I got a chance, he he, he had become a Christian, this man. I got a chance to hold my hands through the food port, hold his hands, and we prayed, and, and we had lovely fellowship together. And he spoke to me about how he was trying to get off from being on death row, but he understood that he'd done wrong, and he had, uh, he was willing to pay for his crimes. And I didn't realize this until this week when I started to study about this topic again. But we had moved here in June of 2000. Well, a governor uh, was elected to the state of New Mexico who was a hardline, you know, law and order kind of guy. And he reinstated uh, execution in the state of New Mexico. And this man that I had prayed with was the first person then to be executed in 2001 uh, under that new law. And then after that, they enshrined the law that said that they outlawed it. So incredible. For 41 years, nobody had been executed. And this one man that I had the privilege of, of praying with was executed. I want to read to you something that he said. Or actually, this is something that the chaplain who was there with him said about this man, Terry Clark. 
I made a couple of trips to see Terry, at which time he informed me that he had instructed his lawyers to cease all efforts to beat the death penalty. He said he was ready to pay for his crimes and ready to meet his Lord. He also stated that he simply wanted to give the family of his victim some peace. And he knew that this would not happen until he was gone. His only request of me was that I serve as the chaplain for his execution. And I thought, wow. Um, This man, he basically willingly went to the the death chamber. Because he could have put up a fight. But he said, no, I, I don't want you to to fight for me anymore, he told his lawyers. He was ready to go. So, the government doesn't bear the sword in vain. The ultimate power of the government would be to end someone's life. And God has allowed that in human governments. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that this is a, um, a foolproof process, that it shouldn't be contested in some way. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that God places such value on human life that if you do evil in that way, you should be afraid. Now look in verse 5. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. You need to submit not just because you might be punished by the government, but because you know that God sees everything that you're doing. You might get away with it before the government, but you won't get away with it before God. For two years, I had a man do my taxes who was, I thought, too aggressive. He asked me, how aggressive do you want me to be with this tax return? And I said, well, I don't know. Fairly aggressive. I don't want to pay more than what I owe. And so he said, okay, leave it with me. And when I saw what he did and how he took so many deductions and some shady things, my conscience was very uneasy and stirred up. And so I had to go back and I had to amend those tax returns and pay the penalty for the taxes that I owed. But I was free and my conscience was clean. And so, you know, we shouldn't just obey because we might be punished, but because... You know, God sees what we're doing and our conscience will stir us up when we do wrong. Verse 6. For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Can I get an amen on that? Don't they attend continually to this very thing of taking your taxes away? Actor Will Rogers once said, We ought to be glad we don't get as much government as we pay for. (laughs) Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So we're to pay our taxes. We're to pay what we owe. We don't have to pay more than we owe. We should take every deduction that we have legal right to. But we're to pay our taxes. We're to pay our customs charges. So we shouldn't be smuggling in Rolex watches through the airport. Selling them over here. We need to give fear or respect to those who are in positions of authority and honor. That's why often we address the judge as your honor. A magistrate of some sort. Or a mayor even. How else can we honor those who are in positions of authority. Well, we can pray for them. 1 Timothy 2.1 Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So we're to pray for our, our government leaders. For the purpose of us leading a quiet and reverent life. So that we can maintain the Christian freedoms that we enjoy in this country. We're to honor those in positions of authority. When I was back in the States over uh, New Year's with one of my girls. We were in an airport and there was a young man there in his military uniform. And three people had come up at separate times to this soldier and said, thank you for your service to our country. 
And I turned to Courtney and I said, I've never seen that in the UK. Not once. And it's sad. I mean, we, we, we do, around November 11th, we'll have a, a, a service here and honor those who have fallen. But I think it's a sad thing when somebody gives their lives and gives their limbs um, to the service of this country and we don't really honor them. The police, we're to honor the police. I hear a lot of disrespect for the police and yet, by and large, they are doing a difficult and good job. And so we need to give them honor and respect. We're to respect the Prime Minister. Doesn't mean we need to agree with everything that he does. Doesn't necessarily even mean that we need to respect him as a person. But we need to respect his position. God has placed him in a position of authority. And as one soldier said, when I salute, I salute the uniform, not the man. I'm saluting the man's position or the woman's position. And we need to give these men and women who are in positions of authority honor because of their position, because God has put it there. So just to sum these things up that we've looked at. What should be our attitude toward the government or to submit to the government? Is it ever right to disobey the government only when they command us to disobey God? What's the purpose of government? It's to restrain evil, to reward good. It's to give common grace. And for this reason, that's why we pay our taxes. And so Christians are dual citizens. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but we're also citizens of these countries on earth. And I was just thinking about all the countries represented in our one fellowship. We've got Brits. We've got some Americans. We've got Nigerians, Hungarians, Spanish, Romanians, Russians, Ukrainians, Zimbabweans. Am I missing any? Hmm? Hmm? Caribbean. That's right. That's right. We've got Jamaicans. So we've got a list of all these different countries here. But first and foremost, we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.20 that we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven in whichever country we are living in. And so we represent the values of the kingdom of God here on this earth. And notice he says, and so it's as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Let me ask you. You're probably a kingdom of the UK if you're here today. But are you a a citizen... Did I say a kingdom of the UK? I I meant a citizen of the UK. But are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Have you been born again into that kingdom? Well, let me be the first to extend an invitation to you. And a peace treaty for you. Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sins. He died, was buried, and rose again the third day so that you could be forgiven and you could come into the kingdom of God and have a relationship with God. And if you put your faith in Him, He will immediately forgive you of everything that you've done. You can be reconciled to Him. And you can be a dual national. You can be a dual citizen. And so, I encourage you to do that today. And as we read right at the beginning when we were dedicating Oriana, you need to receive the kingdom of heaven as a gift just like a little child receives a gift. By faith and receive it gladly. God wants to give you forgiveness. And so I encourage you to take it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace today. Your grace shown to us here in giving us human governments to restrain evil and to reward the good. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. How you died for us on the cross that we might come into a right relationship with you. 
And Lord, I want to pray for anyone here this morning who has yet to receive you that today would be the day of salvation. They'd say, yes, I want that. I, I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. Not I hope so, but I know so. And so Lord, I pray for them that they would make this decision, they would receive you this morning into their hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.